All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus and bless you for your goodness to us, for adopting us into your family. We can actually say it in truth. Abraham is my father. I'm related to him. And I thank you, Father, that you can give us that spirit of adoption that we call you, Abba, Father. And I pray, Lord, as our children sing these songs, that you would bear witness to it in their spirits, even at this age. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Daniel and Josh, welcome back. Good to have you back. Zach and Ashley, it's good to have you here. Welcome. And uh, Jason, Jason is here for the first time as a resident. Welcome. Let's remember to pray uh, for those who are missing, especially for the Scots, and um, also for, uh, you know, just thanking God for their new little life that the Lord gave him, new little sweet little girl uh, here. Pictures look beautiful. And uh, also pray for the Glicos. They're Reese is having camp up in Montana, and so they're going to be gone for the next couple weeks yet. Keep them in our prayers, and keep praying for Mike's mom. God would continue to bring healing, and, and let's also keep praying for Christian. He's gone yet this week, is it? Does he come back next week? Yeah. You're counting the days, huh, Aaron? <laughs> our love and prayers are with you. And Christian, too, as he's gone. And also just want to uh, welcome... Uh, let's see if there are any other visitors. Rose, I want to welcome Rose. And it's, I was pondering today and this week what a joy it is uh, to my personal life to have a family of God that is not just, you know, in your mind where you can relate to God's family, I'm a part of God's family and the big family, all of the Christians over the world. But to have an actual family that you can, you, you can experience the fellowship of brother and sisterhood, that kind of love of the brotherhood as the Bible teaches it to us. It, it, it so blessed me again on Wednesday night, uh, sharing that night of fellowship with you brothers sharing, Dave, you sharing your testimony with us of God's grace in your life and all of us just bearing witness to that. And uh, yeah, just, it blessed me. Also want to welcome you, brother. Um, Pra Praveen, I wanted to uh, announce it correctly, but yes, welcome Praveen. Uh, let's give him a hand of welcome. Praveen, as some of you may not know him well, um, I feel like I know him pretty well. He, he came, he and his family came pretty regularly to the conferences uh, for a number of years in the last four or five years, uh, not so much, but uh, it's good to have you here and we're glad you could uh, make it today. Turn your Bibles with me to Titus. In Titus chapter 2, I've been pondering, in, in particular today, we have the breaking of bread and communion together. And I've been pondering Reese's uh, sermons in the last few weeks a lot, just in my personal life. And it, the, the title that he gave it was A Great Salvation. And as we were singing this morning, the song, He is Worthy, I wondered, is he actually getting his worth out of my life? Is my life expressing his worthiness? And as I pondered that, the Lord brought this question to my heart. Phil, it's all about your attitude of my great salvation. You can do all kinds of things, and religion has done that ever since Jesus died and rose again, has provoked people to do things of great sacrifice, physically, mentally, emotionally.
But the real question is, in your heart, is he worthy? For everything you do, as the word instructs us, do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Are you doing it with that heart of, you are worthy of this, Lord? That attitude changes your whole life experience with Jesus Christ and my life. In Titus chapter 3, actually, verse 3, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice. I want you to get this. Spending your life how are you spending your life? And look at these things the Holy Spirit is addressing. They're issues of our heart. They're issues of our attitude and our thought life. Spending my life in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. Would that describe any of your attitudes as you're driving down the crowded highways? Wishing I could be... What? You cut me off, dude! I'm going to come right up on your taillights. You deserved it. Malice? Maybe a little? Wishing you'd gotten in front of that big truck. <laughs> so slow. Or that old grandma going down the road. Can't believe... Oh, I should be up there by now. Envying their spot. Getting pretty angry about it. Hateful. Hating that. What happened to you? When those kind of attitudes, dear brothers and sisters, begin to come into your heart, knocking at your door. I like how God presented it to Cain. When Cain... This kind of attitude towards Abel. The Lord said to Cain, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. It's crouching. It's ready to spring at you and get you. When these kind of attitudes are crouching at our door, brother, sister, let the kindness, look at verse 4, the kindness of God our Savior and His love appear. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. That's what happens at a moment when sin is crouching at your door, the attitude of your heart towards something, your tongue is about ready to explode. And your thoughts are building up like a thunderstorm cloud. Let the kindness of God, our Savior, appear to you. That very moment, God appeared to Cain. He said, Cain, stop. Consider, your countenance has fallen. Don't do it, Cain. God appeared at that very moment in Cain's life. It was the first time God appeared to Cain that we can read of. The first time God shows up in a, in a powerful manifestation of his kindness and of his love towards you at that very moment when sin is crouching at your door and things are about ready to pour out rain and the thunderstorm and the lightning and the thunder. God will appear to you, dear brother, sister, because he loves you and me. And those moments, God does appear every time to those he loves. He doesn't let you alone. His love cares so deeply that it comes to disarm, to save us from this foolishness, disobedience, deception, enslaved to various lusts. He comes to save us at that very moment. 
Not on the basis, look at verse 5, of deeds which we have done in order in righteousness. He doesn't come because you, for the whole day, did so well. That day, you got up early in the morning, you had your quiet time, it was so refreshing, you were kind and nice to the children, you were beautiful, to, uh, sweet to your beautiful wife, or, or your, your handsome husband, it was just a wonderful day up to this time, and now all this happened and it was building up, so God appears. No. Nothing you've done, nothing that I've done deserves this kind of righteousness. He appears for only one reason, because He loves us. At those moments in our life, Christ appears, not based on the deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's what He comes to you, to wash your thoughts, and the attitude of your heart to wash it, to cleanse it. He stood ready to save Cain. And Cain's story of his life would have completely been changed today and we would be using him as an example of faith, of this, instead of as an example of a reprobate. He could be this beautiful testimony of God's great salvation in his life. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly. He doesn't just give you a little tiny cup of water when you're thirsty and give it to you like in a cup like this size, you know. He doesn't just stand ready to give you a little cup like this of water. I mean, if you guys have been out in this heat, working hard. You know what it's like to get thirsty, right? The boys and I have been running out in this heat. And it's, I mean, after a, a while, you know, out there beating the pavement and the dirt, yeah, I mean, you're thirsty. We come back, we just want ice cold water. And if mom would give us a little cup like this, what would you say, boys? Michael and Lucas. If mom would give you a little cup of water like this after our run, would that be okay? It wouldn't. It wouldn't satisfy. And yet so many times, that's how we receive God's kindness and his goodness in our life when we need it the most. It's like we see Jesus holding out this little cup of water. Oh, it's barely going to get me through, Lord. Thanks for the meager supply of your grace. I'll make it. I'll make it. Does your faith get you past that little supply of Jesus Christ? Or do you see that he stands ready to pour out from his pitcher, his fountain, upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. At that moment, when he saves us, and he has saved us, this great salvation, but also when he saves us from those Cain moments. Thank you. That's it. Comparison right there. Thank you, Dave. Now, if he brought you this full of ice water, could you drink it all? Do you think it would be enough? Whoo! Plenty! Plenty to go around. More than I ever could drink right now. Very good. All my mind goes to um, Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, he tells us, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. The whole world's going this way. According to the prince of the power of the air. This is the way the devil wants you to go. This is his way. 
of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He's working hard to get you to be this disobedient child. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind. Not just giving ourselves to it, indulging into it, loving it. When I think of the word indulging, I think of indulging myself in ice cream. You know, maybe a hot fudge sundae or something like that, or a banana boat. You know, banana split boat. That those big things they make, they even put cream and cherries on top, nuts and indulging in something. That's what we were doing. We were indulging in the desires of the flesh and the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God shows up in that moment as a child of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, dear brothers and sisters, that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And when you and I begin to see that the righteousness that we do has already been created by God and is given to you and I as a gift. This work is a gift. You know, I've, I've had employees for, let's see, since I was 21, I'm 47. How many years that I've had employees work for me? Huh? Did he say 50-something? Check his math, please. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Good try, John. Caught on on that one. I've seen a lot of different guys come and work for me. And there have been people that have worked for me that have just, I call them the passing through guys. You know, this is just something till I get a better job. And so they come in, and, and it's, it's the, the attitude, as long as they're there, and some guys hang out with that attitude for two or three years, have, and, and it, their whole goal of working for me is to, is to get out of here, you know, to work hard so I can go pursue my dream. And that's not wrong. I actually encourage the guys to do that. Go pursue your dream. But then there's guys that come and work for me. And almost every day, they thank me for the job. They are just so blessed, they say, to work here. And I, I, I sit back and I've, I've often wondered at this and thought, what's the difference? There's such a big difference in the attitude of these two people. The one isn't sin, it's not wrong, but it's just, you know, if I ask him to do something, it, 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 sure, maybe, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, I'm going to slug my way through this. I'll, I'll do what I have to do to get where I'm going. But the others have, they see it as a gift. Now, it's hard work. It's not an easy job. Construction in this hot weather is not an easy job. There's no air conditioning except the natural air conditioning that God brings with a breeze flowing through you and... Sometimes that's pretty limited. And they're just sweating and working hard from 8 o'clock in the morning until 4.30 at night. And it's a gift. They're just so blessed to do this hard work because they see it as a gift in their life. Is that how you see your Christian life? I think Jesus looks upon his workers, those whom he sends out into the vineyard. That Jesus said, pray that the Lord would send out labors into the harvest. The harvest is great these days. And I believe that there are probably many Christians who Jesus looks at and he says, yeah, they're just trying to get through it to the next best thing. Just slugging their way through it. And he gets very little thanks for it. Most days they're complaining about the heat. Most days they're complaining about something. Is that you? As a worker 
in the vineyard of Jesus Christ? This life he's given you? Or do you see that you're his workmanship? He created this life and he's given it to you as a gift. And you and I get this glorious privilege of working hard. Yes, the Christian life is hard. First Timothy chapter 2, Paul says to Timothy, and poor hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There is times when we must have endurance to get through that experience. And it's hard. But it all depends how I see it that changes my attitude. When I, can, when I do endure hardness, I see this work, this spiritual experience with Jesus as a gift. Not by something that I'm trying to earn to get to where I'm going, to get to heaven. It's a gift of life from the Lord Jesus himself. Dear brother, sister, if you haven't seen it that way, today, this great salvation can appear to you in a whole new way. And Jesus can step into that hard experience, whatever you're going through. And your countenance may be falling and maybe you're beginning to kind of, you know, there's a thunderstorm building and then your sin is crouching at your door. And the Lord will appear. If you'll see him, he's there knocking. If you'll listen. And he's ready to, if you open up that door, he'll come in, he says, and Revelation chapter 3, to the lukewarm Christian church, those who were so full of themselves, they didn't really need Jesus that much. They said, we're rich, and we don't have much to, that we need. In fact, they said, we have need of nothing. We've got it all, everything we want. Go read the story sometime. I have needed nothing. And Jesus said, what you don't see is I see you as completely naked. You don't even have clothes on in your spirit. You're not clothed with humility. You're so proud. You're standing around naked. And you don't even know it. I want to clothe you with my righteousness, Jesus said, if you'll allow me to. And he stands today at you and I's heart in our life. And he says, I can change your life if you allow me to. And not only will I clothe you, I will come in and I'll eat with you. I'll fellowship with you. The three things that I wanted to look at today, when it comes to this great salvation that Jesus did, is, first of all, the beauty, the most amazing, wondrous experience of forgiveness. Have you really, truly experienced it and are you every day experiencing this great, wonderful, most amazing thing that Jesus stands ready to offer you and I every moment of our day a complete forgiveness, an absolute forgiveness of anything and everything you could do except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit which is attributing something like Jesus standing ready to forgive you as coming from the devil himself. And there's very few that go there. In most cases, I think we, we still have this attitude when I fail Jesus that somehow I have to repay. There's some kind of penance I must do to prove I'm truly sorry. Instead of simply saying, Lord Jesus, I confess my sin to you. 1 John 1.9. Turn your Bibles with me to 1 John 1.9. Let's look at it. First John chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes... What we have, what we beheld and our, handles, our hands handled concerning the word of life. He's talking about, this has been my experience. And the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship with us. 
And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write that our joy may be made complete. In verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. Can you believe the Laodicean church were real Christians just like you and I? They came to church every Sunday. They did it all right. They only had one big problem. They didn't see their need of complete forgiveness that day. In their relationship with Jesus, all was good. I earned it. I have no need of your forgiveness, Jesus, today. I'm doing good right here today. I have no need. They didn't see that they had sinned. They didn't see that they were blind, naked. I'm just going to turn to that real quick and give you the list that Jesus gave them. Verse 15 of Revelation chapter 3. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They were materially rich. You and I are pretty rich. David Witt again reminded us of that last Sunday. Many, many Christians throughout the world have very meager, meager supply of material things compared to you and I. We're rich in comparison. Do you need anything from Jesus? Maybe you think, I have my Bible. I have a songbook. I have the Holy Spirit in me. I'm good. When Jesus looks at your life, would he say, you need me, they need me today? Or would he say, huh, I wonder if she needs me today. She must not. She just gets up, goes about her day. I don't think she needs me. He gets up, he gets up does his thing. and Hello, I'm here. Uh, I don't think they need me today. Is his testimony of your life, they need me today, right now. The Odyssea said, no, I don't need you. They weren't cold, they weren't hot, they were just fine. They had it all, good life. He said, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Would you like that kind of gold? Would you like... Him to test your faith to make it like gold. If you go to Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, he says that the trial of your faith being tested by fire makes it like gold. And then when Peter was writing to these Christians in modern day Syria now and in, in, in Turkey, in that area, Asia Minor, they called it back then, they were undergoing heavy persecution. They were suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. If you got born again, you said you were a Christian, you suffered for it. You were ostracized from your family, just like many Christians today. Perhaps you lost your job. Maybe you lost your, your house. Your, you, you, just, you suffered in real ways. And Peter said, now you've got gold in your life. Your faith that you had towards God, it's now gold. It's becoming gold because it's being tried by fire. And that's what Jesus said this church needed. They needed a faith that was tried and tested by fire so it could become gold. And you know what? They didn't want it. And I don't know about you, but our American Christianity doesn't want it either. There's part of me that is just fine without that. Are you fine without it? Lord, make my day go well. That's all I'm asking. Just make my day go well. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Is that what you're asking from God in your spirit? Or are you willing to come and buy something from Jesus that you don't have, and that's your faith is tested with a fiery trial today? And that'll turn it to gold tonight. But without that fiery trial, you won't have any gold tonight. You'll just have, thank you, Jesus, undisturbed life. It all went well. No trials today. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Man, you're good. So good to me. You see, we have a concept in the Western world. Because we live rich, we have a life like they have lived. We live rich. We don't need anything. And if we do, we'll buy it. Why do we have to pray about it? Yeah, just go work harder and a few more hours. The economy's good. Work is plentiful. And then I'll save up and then I'll buy it. I don't need to ask Jesus for it. I don't have to have any faith about it. I just work for it. That's all. That's how they lived. That you may become rich and white garments, that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Then he says, Behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, will dine with him, and he with me. The three things that I wanted to look at, I'm touching on. But I'll put them in sequential order for you. Recap them. First is forgiveness. The blessedness of experiencing a complete forgiveness every day of my life. Jesus gave us a standard of forgiveness with each other, which is 490 times a day. And Jesus said a day in another place is a 12-hour day. And if you do the math, that's about every minute or two that you're willing to forgive someone who does the same thing over 490 times that day to you. And if you think that Jesus gave you a high standard, Jesus is no hypocrite. What he gives to us, he lives much higher. He'll forgive us every second. Every second. He tells us every two minutes or so, and he does it every second. He is giving you and I a complete forgiveness. He's offering that to you. So that there is not one second in your life that his forgiveness doesn't present itself to you and I. It covers every second of my existence. And one day when I see this great and amazing forgiveness, that all we need to do in 1 John, there again he says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just, righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The moment you confess it, it's done. And Ezekiel 33 and Ezekiel 18, he makes amazing statements. You can read it sometime. God says that when a man repents from his sin, I will never mention it to him again. That sin, I will never talk about it again to him. He's forgiven. To me, that's the beauty of forgiveness. God may not forget it, but he will never mention it to you and I again. What a complete forgiveness. He doesn't hold it over your head. It's over. Complete forgiveness. And David understood this forgiveness, and that's why he lived a life of worship and praise, because he lived in God's great forgiveness. And in Psalm 32, he talks about this. Turn your Bibles with me to Psalm 32. An absolute amazing experience how David, without even experiencing the new covenant in Jesus Christ, he experienced it with God, his God. He says in Psalm 32, verse 1, how blessed, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Paul quotes that to us in Romans chapter 4. And if you want, again, just a beautiful experience, a good look at this blessed forgiveness, read Romans chapter 4. He says this in verse 5. 
Verse 4, now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. It wasn't that you did good all day and now you failed so you earned it. No. He comes to you at that moment when you and I need him. He appears to our Cain experience simply because of his great mercy. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. And then he quotes it. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Dear brother, sister, it takes faith to believe this. Forgiveness, faith, fellowship. Faith to believe that his forgiveness is complete over your life will lead you to do the first step to receive that forgiveness and that's to confess it. Oh, why is it so difficult for us to confess our sins and our need of Jesus? Because of our pride earning spirit. We want to earn it. And there's a pride in us that won't, doesn't want to say, what? Lord, I can't just receive a free gift from you. I have to do something to earn this. I have to have some penance in this situation. I can't just say, everything I am and everything I, 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 I've been forgiven of is just a free gift? What, that, that, that's a freeloader, right? No, what? It is a free gift, dear brothers and sisters. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It's a great salvation. And unless we humble ourselves to receive this free gift and just confess, he has great mercy over my life, then we'll also be able to have mercy over others' lives. See, this was a big problem for the scribes and Pharisees, the righteous, the self-righteous people on the earth in Jesus' day. And it's still a big problem in our religious day. That religious spirit that I have, I don't want to be merciful to others. You know why? Because somehow I'm, I'm working hard to live this righteous life. Aren't you? I'm working hard to get to heaven. This is a tough Christian life. It's a hard, enduring trial. And when you don't meet up with it, when I see some laziness in you or some, you know, whatever sin I think I see, very easy for me to judge you. Come on. Get with it. Humble yourself. Whatever I'm... Isn't that our attitude towards each other as husbands and wives so easily? Or with our children? When we don't have a performance from others, it's because we aren't seeing the great salvation as a free gift to us and we don't deserve any of it. We've received this abundant, blessed life from Jesus and it's my great privilege to share it with you. That faith leads us into fellowship with Jesus and with each other. And that's why he says in 1 John, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you all your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then you have fellowship with each other. See what he says in 1 John? Then if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. And the truth of James will come true to us. In James, he goes, he warns us of two things in James chapter 4. One is, having quarrels and conflicts with each other. He begins there. And he says in verse 6, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Submitting to God is how we resist the devil. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. You sinners and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. And look what happens next. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? And then in chapter 5, he says, verse 7, actually verse 9, do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. So these two things, do not speak against each other and don't complain about each other. Jesus comes with mercy at a moment when we need it and we didn't earn any of it. But God who is rich in mercy. And in chapter 1 of James, he says this. Chapter 2, chapter 2, in verse 12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. What law is that? For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So speak and so act as one who lives under this great mercy of Jesus Christ, of God in my life, not as one who's earning this great salvation. You live like that, you'll judge just like everyone does who earns their salvation. But you live under the mercy of this great blessedness of forgiveness. Your faith is in that great trial, even though the Lord brings a trial of circumstance into your life. You believe that He loves you. That He's going to take you through this. And you allow that to bring it as gold in your life. I call it the golden attitude. That's what turns gold. My attitude turns golden. It becomes worth gold to my wife and my boys. It's like I gave them gold when they get your attitude. Have, any, have you ever seen someone who got gold? You know, back in the days, Colorado was full of gold miners. And when they got gold, you can read the stories. When they got gold, man, they were exalted. They were just, there was so much joy in the camp. I mean, gold was happiness. Is your attitude a deposit of gold into your wife, into your husband? into your children. It brings forth happiness, exaltation. Let it be tried with fire. But if you're like a Laodicean Christian, I don't have need of that. I'm all good. But your attitude is like a naked person walking around and they don't even, you can tell them they don't have clothes on and they'll say, I do too. What's your problem? Blind, wretched, and miserable is the attitude of one who needs nothing. Blind, wretched, and miserable. Then we have fellowship with each other. The fellowship that Jesus speaks of in John 14, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, where he says, if you love me, do my commandments. Love that flows I now do because I love so much, because I see how much he loves me and his forgiveness is so blessed. I'll gladly share it with you, Michael, or Lucas, or mom, Katie. I'll gladly share it with you, my brothers and sisters, because I'm living under this wonderful, blessed forgiveness every second. 
then we'll have fellowship with each other. And we'll have the fellowship of Jesus where he said, my father and I will come and we'll stay with you. We're not coming and going, coming and going. It's not a two minute, you know, a two hour time in the beginning of the day or at the close of the day, we have a little bit of fellowship. No, no, I'm staying. My father and I will come and we'll abide. That means we take up residence and this body of yours becomes my dwelling place, my temple. And I'll purify it. I'll continue to make it holy. Forgiveness, faith, fellowship. The great salvation that Jesus brings to you and I. And he's standing right here today at this very moment saying, will you let me in? I don't care what you did this morning. I don't care how your week was. Will you come and fellowship with me? Will you receive my absolute forgiveness? You need it. You just don't know it. You, don't, you have no idea how much I'm forgiving you every second of every day. You don't have a clue. But I am. Else you'd be dead long ago. You'd be burning in hell today. I'm here and I'm forgiving you and I'm making intercession daily with the Father saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the Father is for actually forgiving you. Will you receive that? Will you let your eyes be anointed with eyes out that you could see His amazing, wondrous forgiveness over your life? And will you believe that? Put your faith in it so that you live it in the reality of his forgiveness. And let that faith be purified like gold so that your attitude becomes golden to those whom you're around. A deposit of gold and joy. The end of 1 Peter chapter 1 is that you will have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Though you don't see him yet believing, you're rejoicing with joy unspeakable unspeakable and full of glory. That means the attitude of your heart is so full of joy, you can't even talk about it, but it's felt in the room. Wherever you go, your joy amiates. And it radiates out of your life like a sun. You're the light of the world. And you have fellowship with Jesus. He's abiding. And you have good fellowship with each other because mercy triumphs over judgment every time, every time, every time. Mercy triumphs over judgment when you deal with me. Dear brother, sister, don't settle for this little cup, this meager supply of grace in your life. It's what the Laodiceans did. Don't settle for it in this rich economy in which you live. As I've seen in my life, as the economy improves, my spiritual richness towards God declines. Unless, unless I intentionally draw near to God and he draws near to me, that changes it all. Unless you do that every day, as your economy improves, your need of Jesus declines. You become one of those who lives a daily experience of getting up. And Jesus is saying, hello, good morning. You don't even hear it. He's forgiving you and you don't even know it. And become wretched and miserable by the end of the day. Because you know you didn't do that well. And you try to somehow pay it, make it up to Jesus. And he's saying, I don't want your makeup. I want to forgive you. I want your need of me. That's what I'm looking for. Let's come and fellowship with him in our greatest need. Oh, Father, we come. And I thank you for this amazing, great, blessed forgiveness for the faith that you have allowed us, you created this whole idea of faith and you've opened the door that we can come and please you this way. And Lord, thank you for the fellowship that you give to us.
In Jesus' name, amen.